Well, good morning and welcome to Zen Live, or a new a metaphor for your toolbox. And uh, uh, last night, we uh, it was Friday night, and we watched had our Friday night movie, and we've been watching this uh, box set of Cary Grant movies. And uh, last night was uh, the movie was uh, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, Cary Grant, Myrna Loy, Shirley Temple. You see. Shirley Temple was a teenager here, and uh, I don't think she'd be, I think that was, uh, people didn't, people didn't like her, the conversation last night was, well, Shirley Temple didn't last as a movie star because she could never uh, upstage herself as a little girl, you know, so as a, so anyway, but she was a teenager here and a Bobby, a Bobby Soxer, and um uh, there were several interesting things about this movie, but basically it was a uh, uh, mother-daughter competition for Cary Grant. And uh, uh, as these 40s, roman 40s uh, romances uh, were all uh, bedroom comedies, basically. Um, but the interesting metaphor in this movie was the knight in shining armor. And uh, that was a... Uh, you know, a popular metaphor, my knight in shining armor. So that actually in the movie, uh, The Bachelor, Cary Grant, who was an artist, man about town, uh, gave a talk at a high school. And so the uh, Bobby Soxer saw him visually as her knight in shining armor. So he, be, he began, you know, she was uh, fixed, you see, infatuated. And, and of course, in the movie, they actually showed him standing there in shining armor, and uh, so she fell in love with him. So then, uh, uh, of course, he was in his forties. So uh, and the her mother was a judge. So there was this tangled up, and then she saw him as a knight in shining armor. So now she fell in love with him. So anyway, the Bobby Soxer went back to her boyfriend, and these two went off to live ever uh, happily ever after. But the point was that was interesting about the movie was that the Bobby Soxer, I think in the 40s it really began, it showed the uh, emergence of the teenage, the teenager, the teenage culture as a intermediate zone between childhood and adulthood. And the teenagers then had their own cars, their own language, their own behaviors. And, uh, and uh, also, Bobby Soxers were uh, girls who were infatuated with teen idols like Frank Sinatra and uh, the crooners. And the music of the 40s, night and day. You are the one, and I've, as as you know, I've been kind of like infatuated myself with the uh, music of Cole Porter here recently because it really reawakened or pointed out to me the uh, mystical uh, yearning of the romantic songs of the '40s for this one, this yearning for the one that was transcendent of all human beings, you know, you are the one. And this, this, um, there seemed to be a um, breakout uh, of this uh, knight in shining armor that is the one. Uh, the breakout of the one in uh, music and romantic stories in this romantic story here. Uh, this was basically a, uh, a romance, kind of like Midsummer's Night Dreams. It was kind of like a dream uh, in which there was this this infatuation, this love for, or the awakening of the one, or unity, the awakening of unity, uh, in uh, uh, as a transcendent, an infatuation with it. <gasps> you see, uh, the seeing of unity, which it means the end of separation. Unity is the end of separation, and separation is suffering, says the Buddha. When the one is divided, all right, so when the one is divided into two, so here's one, now you're two, there's suffering. 
there's a yearning for unity back again. I watched, uh, you know, went up to Washington, uh, D.C., went to the Kennedy Center and saw my daughter and Hedwig in the ha Angry Inch. And that whole play was about the yearning for unity. And it's based on the uh, Greek or uh, Plato's myth about the origin of man. And the original human being had uh, two heads, four arms, four legs, and both sexes. So it was androgynous. And because it was stable, because it was stable, it was very powerful, and the gods were jealous and threatened. So they had Zeus cut him in half. So man got cut into two halves, male, female. And now they yearn to restore the original unity uh, that was stored in their memory. So each half remembers the one. And they spend their lives, they spend history yearning for the one. And of course this is, gets translated into the biblical Genesis where Adam and Eve are separated from the one, which is the Garden of Eden. It's not a place, it's the one. And they're separated from it, and now they wander through history searching for the one, you see. And of course this gets, in our culture, secular culture, the one is framed in a romantic relationship, where it's really a spiritual relationship. In the Middle Ages, there was no romance. It was a mystical, the one was transcendent, and you became a monk or a nun in order to fulfill the, uh, uh, to, to unite yourself with the one, you see. So the monastic tradition in the Middle Ages was a unity, uh, was a way to experience unity with the one, where the two become one, you see. And so it wasn't until late the Middle, Middle Ages that romantic love bloomed. It was new. Had nothing to do with marriage. Still doesn't. <laughs> In a sense, <coughs> we mythologize, we myth, we mythify it, you know, so that uh, we all want to have romantic, a romantic awakening of the one, the experience of unity, and then marriage, of course, seals it forever. But it doesn't. You see, it's transitory. Why? because our society doesn't support it. Let's take a look at Tolley to see if we can pick this cotton ball apart here. So, Mr. Tolley says, the ego doesn't know that the source of all energy is within you. So it seeks it outside. It is not the formless attention which is presence that the ego seeks but attention to some form, some object, such as recognition, praise, admiration, or just to be noticed in some way, to have its, its existence acknowledged. Okay, the ego doesn't know that the source of all energy is within you, so it seeks it outside. Right there. Now, we talk a lot about this um, at least I do, <laughs> at least I'm interested in this, uh, is that the uh, understanding and seeing of how I, as a separate sense of self, arises. My whole spiritual journey began, basically, as I look back on it, I didn't know it at the time, but there was this intense suffering of suffering, of feeling outside of my experience, outside of the group, outside of the world, uh, always uh, the little guy looking through the window at the happy people inside, which is basically what an advertisement is. When you look at an advertisement, you're outside and the people are happy because they took this medicine <laughs> or they got this new car or they got this new house. Oh, they're so happy. And I'm kind of like out here, you see, looking through there, and they're so happy. Oh, I want that happiness. I want that unity. I want that presence. I want that love. What do I have to do? Oh, well, just buy this car. Or just get this house. Or just take this drug, you see. So that's the world we live in. The transcendent one, 
the night and day, you are the one, is yearning inside of us, is yearning inside. We think about it all the day. We think about it all day. It's in the hide of us, this yearning. It's deep in the hide of us, you see. In the roaring traffic's boom, in the silence of my lonely room, I think of you, the one, you see. But this is not some form. But in our secular, materialistic, economically consumer world, the culture transubstantiates the transcendent one that our heart longs for into a product or an it. So we live in an I-it world. Now it is just a uh, word, a fill in the blank for everything. This is an it. I'm an it. You're an it. The light's in it, the fan's in it, the room is in it, the cosmos is in it, the sun, the galaxy is in it. My feelings are it, my emotions are it, so I feel anxious, I feel happy. That's an it. If you experience it, it's an it. So everything is an it in our secular it world. So we live in an it world. You see, but if we live in an it world, then the I is outside of it because you can't experience something unless you are outside of it. If you are the experience, there is no I there. And of course, all of our sports, our wars even, everything that we, uh, all of our entertainment, we have to pay for transcendence. We have to pay to transcend the I-it experience. So you go to a movie, if the movie's good, the movie's not an it. It's only an it when you're sitting in the audience and uh, somebody says, you got any popcorn? Well, the, po the person is an it, the popcorn's an it, and I'm an, and I'm an I having irritatingly experienced the experience of being separated from the movie, you see. So the movie, when we're in the movie, is not an it. Watching the, um, this is an interesting experience uh, for me as, as I, uh, 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 I'm kind of like a, in mindful of how the mind works. And so we have a friend of ours here who uh, is hard of hearing, so we put the subtitles on. And I know, now you can play this, you can look at uh, CNN and that's got subtitles. So you can notice this, the switching back and forth between awareness as or awareness of it, you see. So when you're watching the movie and you're in the movie, you're, 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 the movie is not an it because your eye disappears. It surrenders to the movie. It's called suspension of disbelief. The I, it, awareness is suspended when you watch a movie. That's why we like movies. But then you put subtitles on it. Now this interesting thing happens is that when you read the subtitles, you become an I and the subtitles become an it. And you feel you're not quite in the movie when you're looking at subtitles. Or look at it on CNN or all in the breaking news. You're watching the breaking news, you're in it, and then there's a subtitle. Now, you, when you, you break the hold of the uh, awareness as the video, awareness as the news, is broken when you have to read the subtitle. Just check this out. It's an interesting thing. And then you can't, you can't do both at once. You can't be in the, involved in the video and read the subtitles at the same time, at simultaneously. So that's just kind of like a little uh, example of the flipping back and forth we go through all the time. So this I, it, you see, is a separation from it. That's the way it works. And this is a necessary uh, awareness because it's a survival one. You know, I mean, if you're, I'm aware of that bus coming. 
the people that take you take LSD. I don't advise that saying do, but I'm just talking about the experience of drugs. The experience of why we're all addicted to drugs is because drugs dilute the I it experience of exile. You smoke pot. This becomes so you become the food. Oh, you become you are you are not aware of food, having an experience of food. You are the food. You are the tasting. You are what you are doing, you see. So let's get to the, all right, so the, the Tully says here, let's, let's try and stay on track. <laughs> the source of all energy is within you. Now right there, language uh, confuses us uh, because if you say the source of energy is within you, we automatically say, well, I'm a you is an it. So the source of energy is in with me as a thing. No, that's not what we're saying here. The source of energy is not within you as a thing, although that's the way we interpret that. But we don't get, we don't go where he's pointing. So presence. So then he says, uh, it is not the formless attention it, it, it is not the formless attention, which is presence, that the ego seeks. All right, no, formless attention. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, I, it, consciousness, which is basically what we believe is consciousness. Western individual consciousness. See, this whole culture the impetus of it, the force of it, is towards individuation. We look at Korean culture, North Korea. The impetus there is towards unity with the whole and the, the uh, uh, removal or the um, uh, 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 dissolution of uh, the watering down of the sense of individuation. So you look at the communist society, there are no individuals. Individuation is anti-communist. <laughs> this is why there's such this conflict between capitalism and American. It's not about capitalism, it's about individuation. The driving force of Western culture is towards individuation and the freedom of the individual to have new experiences. Why does the individual have to have new experiences? Because without experience you don't exist. So the I as a, a sense of me exists because it has experiences. No experience. If we're not having exciting experiences, it's boring. Let me out, turn the TV on, do something, start a fight. I can't stand this boredom. I don't exist in boredom. It's, I gotta have something, something to grab hold of, something new, a new product, a new movie. So our whole culture is like a meat grinder that cranks out new experience. What's new? You go to the internet, you go to the movie, you go everywhere you go. What's new? If you go to a website, if there's nothing new, you don't go there anymore. <laughs> there has to be something new. What is something new? A new experience. Why do we have to have a new experience, you see? Because without something new, you see, experience becomes um, boring unless it's a surprise. You see, I want to be surprised. If I'm not surprised, I'm not having an exciting experience. If I'm not having an exciting experience, I don't feel I exist. So I, have to, I exist by having new experience. So we have created a society that cranks out new experience, new movies. Marriage becomes boring. I've got to have a new experience. 
I got to have an erotic experience. So I got something on the side to have an erotic experience. So I exist. So we feel we don't exist, you see. Our existence stops when experience stops. This is why we look at other cultures and, uh, or well, monastic culture. So people go to the, uh, uh, go to uh, a retreat, a weekend monastic retreat. And what do you do when you go to a retreat? You leave experiences of the world at the door. You don't bring your TV, you don't bring your uh, computer, you don't bring your novels, you don't watch movies. All you do, wash dishes, sweep the floor, meditate. No stimulation, S plain food. You don't have a big menu of experiences to choose from. And the mind goes crazy. It brings up to the surface our addiction to new experiences in our culture, you see. And it's all based on the fact that this I, the experiencer, the chooser, is a culturally created individual who needs new experience. So we have a whole economy to crank out new experiences. You don't crank out the same product over and over again, they have to make it a better product every year. They got to add some new little trinket or some new little gimmick or something so they can advertise it as a new experience. Get this crest, it's new. Wow, the old crest now is bad. I want the new crest. <laughs> and after you use it, it's the same old crest. <laughs> It's like a new kitchen. We got a new kitchen. We had the old kitchen. Had a little money. I want a new kitchen. I want a new experience. A new, better kitchen. So we got a new kitchen. And for a while it was like, oh my God, come on in. I want to show you my kitchen. Now it's just our same old kitchen. <laughs> you see? So what's new today is going to be what's old tomorrow. And I got to have something new. So I, I hope you get a sense of this, you know, that the whole culture is fundamentally based on cranking out new experience that affirms my sense of I. Okay, so, but attention to form. See, experience, the it, is form. This is a materialistic society and materialistic society means that only form exists. Everything is matter. Even you are determined or created by the brain, which is matter. Okay? So the whole, let there be one. Well, if you've got mind and you got matter, is everything mind or everything matter? Choose one or the other. Well, each you can't do that. You end up the eternal argument between realism and idealism. What's the one? You see, what's the it? You want to reduce it down to an it. What is it, you see? Mind or matter? What is the one, mind or matter? Well, if you choose one, the other one cries for existence. If you choose that, the other. So you get in, this is where Zen takes you. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Put them together and you get the one, you see. The two that's one. So that brings us to Tolley's talk about presence. What is presence? Presence is not an experience. You can't have an experience of presence. Why? Because presence is not an it. We can only experience it. And when you experience it, you are having an experience of it, but you aren't it. You're having the experience of you. You are the experiencer, a sense of I, outside of experience, having an experience. And the experience is going to be either pleasant or unpleasant or boring, neutral. 
So, of course, we want pleasant experience, and a pleasant experience is going to be a new experience. Old experience is not pleasant. You've had it. <laughs> I already did that. I already read that. I read that. I read that. It was Sheldon and the boys at the uh, comic book club. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Oh, there we go, a new one. Uh, my mother-in-law was a addicted, I'll say addicted, to harlequins. She loved harlequins. Never threw one out. The whole When we moved in here, the whole house, every room had shelves and shelves and shelves of harlequins. So, what was I going to say? But <laughs> anyway, she, she noticed once, she was reading the harlequin, and she realized that the author, using a different name, had written the same, taken the same plot, and just put it with, uh, put new clothes on it. Put the same plot, same comment, same talk, same conversation in a new situation. So it wasn't good because she'd already had that experience, you see. Well, this is no good. It's no surprise here. Nothing new. It's just the old rehashed old, recycled old. So uh, she called up Harlequin and reported it, and they just said, okay, they all, they all do that. They send her some new books. <laughs> anyway. To sum up, I got my clock there, so I don't want to run over. Presence is not an I, not an experience. So the source of energy is within, was in presence. Presence is night and day. You are the one. Getting back to Cole Porter, this thing just keeps ringing in my head. You know, me and you become one in. A relationship that transcends experience and it becomes creative. Creative relations, creative creativity is transcendent of the experience of it. When it's get when it experience gets divided into either or and you can't choose that's called a double bind oh should I choose this one or that that one or this one oh but wow 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 can't choose now come help me choose this can't make up my mind on which cup would you help me which should I choose I can't choose which philosopher I can't choose which religion I can't choose which person to marry yeah, I can't choose which it, you see. Uh, so, this inability to choose creates the conditions for a creative leap into a whole new idea. And that is, well, I'm really, I got to stop here because I'm moving into a whole other area. So, we're going to end with that and... Uh, and we'll pick up this, we'll kick this can down the road here about what presence is and why presence is not experience. And how we get out of the search for new experience and stumble into presence. So thanks for dropping in. And uh, as you see, I, I'm, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to stop from meandering on here for too long. So thanks for dropping in and I'll see you this evening.